I have half an hour <coughs> to talk about complex numbers in C++. Um, my name is Andre Wagner. I'm from Native Instruments from Berlin, Germany. And for those of you who don't know us, so we build um, yeah, music software. So our business is sound, basically, and, and, yeah, and software, of course. So and so, complex numbers not directly a topic, but um, it could be if um, that would be better implemented or if people would know more about that. Uh, my, my background is also I'm a physicist, so I worked a lot with with complex numbers in while doing while my studying and also doing numerical simulations. But I come come to the applications in a moment. So um, I assume everybody um, in the room knows what complex numbers are. But um, or is there anybody who doesn't know what a complex number is? So anyways, I, I just for the case I. Prepare a quick summary. So, a complex number is just a composed number of uh, which has a real and a imaginary part, um, or actually composed of two real values, and um, then there's that weird imaginary unit um, that fulfills that weird property that it, if it's squared, it's minus one, or the square root of minus one is i. And following from that property of i, we have the following um, algebra that basically comes. To just falls out from that property. So uh, um, adding two complex numbers is like adding real and imaginary parts respectively. And multiplication is a little bit more complex um, or complicated operation due to the i squared. You get a minus here and a little bit um, strange behavior. So um, it's, but, but still the result is again a, a complex number. So, um, so just as a summary, if you, in case you didn't remember, so also just just another picture. So complex numbers, usually if you draw them, you, of course, since it's a real and imaginary part, you have always this real axis and the imaginary axis. So that's a complex plane. And the complex number is basically kind of a vector in that plane, which has like an absolute value and a uh, phase or angle. So that's another way of seeing complex numbers. And then you all know that like adding and multiplying then there are certain properties. So if you multiply two complex numbers, you multiply their absolute values and you add their angles and things like that. So, and you quickly have, depending on how it's set up, you can get, get, can get rotation in the, in the complex plane, for instance. So before I come back to that, a um, few words about applications. So there's a big area. Uh, so actually it's, Applications are basically everywhere in uh, any kind of engineering and scientific fields. So most obvious one is signal processing, electrical engineering. That's uh, they are just ubiquitous. So their complex numbers are just fundamental. So every kind of process you model there, it's then you don't use. If you don't use complex numbers, you you it's, everything gets much more complicated. Physics, of course. So um, like the Schrödinger equation in quantum. So the base of quantum theory is based on complex numbers. So this is like it's just fundamental there and in many other processes as well. Fractals a little bit esoteric. So the Mandelbrot set, for instance, is just an iteration of complex of a map of complex numbers. And you just measure the Lyapunov exponent. And, and then you get that nice picture, which is basically just a stability map of that complex equation. Then falling from that, you have like chaos theory, complex systems. So that's the field I worked in. And there you have a lot of complex numbers as well. And then also I found something like radar systems, optical systems, they use complex numbers. So it's just everywhere. And, it's, and as soon as you have software and you work in maybe one of those fields, so in my case, it was um, like chaos theory, complex systems, physics, and now it's, main, it's uh, more or less signal processing. In the case of audio, you, uh, it's pretty nice if you, have, um, if you can deal with complex number in a streamlined and easy way. So. <clears throat> If you, so if you do kind of that stuff, you are usually interested in speed. So because you do, you do numerics and you want stuff fast. So because if you do number crunching and usually when you do number crunching, if, if, it's, if it's really like stream processing or really out, throughput is important, either you do big simulations and you want to have them, of course, the costs for your simulation is, um, is expensive. You want to minimize that. Or in our case, um, if you do audio, you, you want to have like, the user should be able to run as many synthesizers on his computer as possible, for instance. So there should be, um, this should be possible. So the slower the whole thing gets, the less, um, so a factor of two already means you can only run twice as um, many 
twice as less um, yeah, applications, for instance, on one system. Um, so there is the standard, so the order SDL. I'm not, I'm not sure quite if it's really part of the SDL or if it's like beyond the SDL. So I don't know if it, uh, Alex um, put it in or Bjarne put it in or somebody else, but there is um, STIT complex. So there's a, there's a little class that comes bundled with a standard library, uh, basically uh, since back in the days, at least 98. I don't know if, when it came in, so couldn't find anything about that. And <clears throat> this gives basically access to via operator overloading, so basically the classical C++ way you have a you have a complex number and you can deal with it in a streamlined fashion. Um, so that's basically almost it. So in the, I mean, usually if you do C++, I mean, many people used to do and, and still do Fortran because everybody says Fortran is so fast and blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is not really true to some extent. It, is kind of true, but um, you can get, of course, the same performance with C and C++, but you have to know what you're doing. But in Fortran, a lot of stuff is just built in. So, but nowadays, of course, Fortran is, besides of number crunching, Fortran is a pretty ugly language, and so a lot of modern um, scientists and engineers switch to C and C++, which is basically the only alternative out there if you really want to have speed for number crunching. and. But then you're on your own. So C++ by default only basically brings that um, stit complex and there's val array that most of people don't know. This is like a vector that, which you can add and then there's a numeric header and that's and, and mass and that's about it. So there's not much. So a lot of stuff is developed like like all the linear algebra numeric stuff is, comes from outside and there are many, many implementations. So it would be actually have nice to at least that the stuff that is there, there should be a little bit more in the standard and this stuff should be at least working. I come to that later. So, um, so that's how you use it. So for those of those who didn't know that, that there is a complex number in the STL, um, so it looks like that. So it's, you just include header complex. And so even C got uh, some complex um, numbers now. Or I think it's C99. As a template parameter, you say you can specify float or double. In theory, it should be possible to add like also fixed point numbers there. Um, yeah, you initialize with your real imaginary part. Um, there's also uh, like a function constructor that constructs a complex number from polar coordinates, so from the um, radius and angle which you specify, and it returns a complex number. And then you can just work with them in in the mathematical way, in the convenient way. You just multiply an atom, so all the operations are overloaded. Um, so, what can you do with it? So. Um, the, like a nice way to create a um, oscillator. So really, if you need an oscillation, so you need maybe just a sine function, for instance, that would be an oscillator. The, the, this is like the fastest way you can write an oscillator in C++ using this that complex class. So you have so your little oscillator class has like um, two complex numbers, which is one is the state and the other one is basically the update, so the speed of rotation. And then you just have your call operator and this simply updates the state by multiplying it with the rotation and um, returns the real part. So if you, in case you're only interested in the real valued oscillation. And yeah, and the, the important part is that the polar coordinate is like the absolute value is one and this would be the frequency. So, and the property of the complex numbers is that they start rotating, um, they, that the angles get added under the multiplication and the radius get multiplied. So the radius in that case, or the absolute value is one, so one times whatever the other one is, uh, stays the value of the other one, and the angles just get um, forwarded by that amount. So this just gets added to the angle of the state, so that's why it's rotating. Uh, you see a little picture down here. Oh, sorry, that has moved a little bit. Anyway, that's, that's just illustrated again, so that basically the complex number is rotating in the plane through that. Um, um, operation and the real part would look basically like that. So you get the sinusoidal output. Yeah, also just for, for the fun of it, I add also using C++14, you don't even have to write a class anymore. You can just write a little function that returns a lambda and using those um, initializers here, you can put the you know, values right in there and have just a lambda that computes the complex number. So this is just a nice little, even more compact way to write an oscillator in C++. So that would be actually pretty neat if you could just do more math in that really compact and streamlined fashion uh, and just hope that it's fast. Yeah? So, 
Okay, that was just the thing again. A bit more complicated, so another really interesting example I want to give you is um, the complex or complex resonator, it's sometimes called, um, um, that's basically the simplest possible way to um, construct a bandpass filter. So for those of you who are not know so much about filter theory and band filters, bandpass filter is simply a filter that, is, I mean, it's all over in, in engineering that a filter that filters out all the frequencies except for a certain band of frequency range, which you can specify for the filter. Everything else gets filtered out, so it's like this typical radio effect, for instance, like old radio effect, that would be a bandpass filter. So um, that you know kind of how it sounds like. And the, the quickest way again is using state complex. So you would basically the same as the oscillator before. So you have your state and your rotation. And now you simply have an external state that would be your input signal. It creates the output signal. And the, the way it works is simply you still have the same update, but you just add the input signal. And just naturally, this is a bandpass filter. And you have perfect control over it. So because the radius kind of controls your bandwidth of your bandpass filter and the center frequency basically calls, um, controls the position in the, in the frequency range. So this is like, this one, this one is also the nice property of that bandpass filter is also that it's very stable. So it's, it's, you can go down to very low frequencies um, and you can easily modulate it because it only depends on its last state and not the second to last. Usually if you go, if you use like those standard DSP filters, I always have the also, not one history step more, and then it gets unstable under modulations, but this one returns, um, stays stable. So this is also why it's nice to have complex numbers, because it's real, not only that it's, um, that it's um, more streamlined, um, it's also pretty, yeah, it's more stable and, and easier to write. So I had, now coming to the, the actual part, so about performance. I had a little bit more complicated problem. I was just looking on some time ago, a little side project of mine, where like a filter bank and I had a bunch of those resonators, they were coupled with each other and it was a little bit more complicated expression. So I thought, hmm, because I had other problems before where I had like a little matrix vector multiplication and a friend of mine who's the author of Boost ODE and um, I told him, yeah, I would like to use expression templates there, but he said, oh, it's, it should just work out of the box and then I I tried it and it worked pretty fast, but then I changed it a little bit and suddenly it was much slower and then I used expression templates and it was fast again. So I thought, mm, I checked that. I mean, they are simpler than just the matrix and vector and maybe the compiler somehow knows about them. And so I just checked if, um, I just double checked with a um, handcrafted version. So that's basically, so this is the same thing again as before almost. Um, okay, the numbers are a little bit different, but this is basically what the compiler should create for us. So this is how it should look like in theory. I mean, I have a, in the, in the example before, I create a complex number here and then assign it. So I assign, I have two assignment operations. Now I have only, only one. So the only, I have only one temporary and then the direct assignment. So there should be maybe one move less, but that's about it. So that's what I would expect from a compiler that this version should run at all, just a little, slightly bit slower and but what I have seen is this. So the red one is the stit complex and the yellow one is the handcrafted version. So I actually started out at Clang originally because I always use Clang. I have a lot of um, templates usually in my code and Clang is still the best when it comes to optimizing templates away. Um, but I now, of course, when, while preparing all of that, I also checked with the other compilers and did some more research, how they perform and what, what are the, the problems there. So. Um, the VC14, so this all run on, on this machine basically. So I just um, sent that resonator you just saw um, was a whole big, big signal. So it was basically just Nyquist frequency. So alternating um, values and just measured the time. So the time is blotting in milliseconds. And of course it's averaged over many, many runs. Um, so the interesting thing is now um, GCC, the handcrafted version is still, I mean, this is kind of the gap I would have expected, maybe a little bit less. But in Clang, it's almost a factor of three. And also, VC14 is still slower compared to Clang. So I don't know which, uh, so it was run via Wine. So I don't know which kind of overhead. In theory, Wine is not an emulator, so it should be as fast. So it should just um, wrap the calls to the Win API, but I don't know. So there might be some overhead, but my <clears throat> in my experience, it's anyway that uh, I haven't seen the Microsoft compiler performing very well 
on performing numerical things or usually has a lot of more memory transfer operations than required and especially on recursive operations like those one here. So doesn't surprise me, it wouldn't surprise me if it's really as fast as Clang or GCC. Uh, or it would surprise me if it would be as fast. So, but there, there's a big gap. So what I um, did, um, originally I did, okay, mm, I always wanted to do a little bit more with expression templates. Um, instead of looking into the details because I thought, oh, they must have done it right and um, they, it's, it's, it's probably ex the, the expression template problem that the compiler just cannot optimize it. So who has worked with expression templates? Okay, so already half of this. So just to give you a quick summary of that, or re recap, um, so expression templates is, is a technique, a very common technique, especially if you're doing numeric stuff. So if you want to have fast, or if you're building a um, domain-specific language, so if you want to embed a custom language in your code um, that does computations at compile time, so it's one of those hardcore meta programming techniques. And the core idea, especially, I mean, this was, I think, originally also invented for like linear algebra somewhere in the 90s. So the core idea is that um, instead of computing, so that the t idea is you don't compute the result eagerly, you, um, you, um, you compute everything um, lazy. So the, the, all the operations are overloaded and instead of returning the result immediately, they return a proxy object that encapsulates the operation and, the, and a reference to the operands. So you don't, so if you call the multiplication operator, you don't compute the result, you just return a, an, a proxy to the operation and the arguments. And then if you put that together with the next operation, you have a proxy to a proxy that has all the arguments and operations. And it can be get very complicated if you have big expressions and then there are kind of like a um, lot of um, meta programming techniques to uh, like speed this whole thing up to make, so to prune the tree and then filter that and all kind of, so basically it's a technique to help the compiler streamlining operations. So especially getting rid of temporary variables and also like getting rid of unrolling for loops or just having one for loop instead of many and so on. So for linear algebra, it usually is still gives you a lot of performance. For that, I wouldn't have expected that the performance is much better actually. So um, just a quick sketch of how that's looked like for those who don't know. Um, so. The core idea is you overload your operator star for your, yeah, for your left and right hand side, so that would be your complex numbers, for instance. And now in instead of returning the result immediately, you return a expression that encapsulates a, yeah, somehow a tag or policy that describes the operation and then the left and right hand types and it stores the references to the type so that the expression could be as simple as that. It's just holding the references and then you have, you need those three things. Um, you need the evaluation of the expression, which calls the operator on the evaluated left and right hand side. And then you have a fallback for non-expressions, which does is the identity function. And then your multiplication would, for, look, for instance, look like that. So that um, has a member function apply, whatever, whatever you call it. So apply is called here. So this is that apply, which returns the actual multiplication. So, and you stick that all together in this. You would overload your assignment operator of your complex number type so that it actually the assignment would then call the eval and the eval would just go down the tree of operations. So because eval calls eval in each of the left and right hand side. So if those are numbers, it's just <coughs> numbers. But if left or right hand side is an expression again, it will call the eval of that expression and so on and so on until you reach the leaves and then you, in the end, you get the full result. So this usually makes, uh, makes it for the compiler easier to um, get, um, yeah, to speed up the computation. Um, just for the sake of it, I also thought, okay, um, I, I, of course I looked in the headers, but I didn't scan really in detail. Um, I, usually they do a lot of stuff, so um, in the headers, so it's hard to see what actually is happening sometimes. So I thought, okay, just let's make a really simple, naive, so I call it naive implementation, which, which would be the straightforward eagerly evaluating implementation. So that means I have a complex number, of course, I mean, this is trivial, so you have a, your real and imaginary part, some member function to access them, and then you have, for instance, again, the multiplication operator would look like that. You just implement the, the algebra of complex numbers, so real part, and you just compute them. So now, measuring those results, it looks like this. So this is also much, this is very interesting. So obviously, in the case of the Microsoft compiler, um, expression templates help really the compiler. So this is 
The greenish one is the naive implementation, which is still a little bit faster than the one from the split complex for some reason. And the expression template version is almost twice as fast, or two thirds maybe, um, and is basically on par with the handcrafted version, at least for the Microsoft compiler. The expression templates really help. And to speed up the, the optimization for the compiler and of course, still, I mean, the, the obvious thing is the, the stiff complex and it's pretty slow. And Clang basically, uh, as expected, would be the um, expression template and naive implementation. They are basically same speed, so there's no difference, but still both are slower than the handcrafted version. So it's still the handcrafted, it cannot, the compiler doesn't quite um, get the performance of the handcrafted version. Interesting, so the, at least the Clang and the GCC handcrafted version, they are same speed, so at least though these are identical. So you can get the speed of, um, of GCC with Clang, but you have to basically write it out. So you don't can use abstraction, but we want, we are using C++ because we want abstraction, so it, compilers should get better in that. And uh, even expression templates. Maybe I, I thought about even overloading the, the the assignment itself so that you have a ternary operator and then you could like the, the, the trick I was doing with a temporary variable, something like that maybe. There are some, I could assume that you can write some custom kernels for your expressions that maybe get to the speed, but I mean then you start really a lot of engineering for actually very simple problems. So um, compilers should be able to do that and you basically, coming to the next slide, you will see that actually compilers can do that. But um, actually um, only GCC has still again the best performance, so basically it's always the case um, from, my, from my experience that if you want performance and you have the choice to choose a particular compiler and platform, always use GCC because it's still the best, so you see it in that case. Um, but of course you still see that gap here. So I also looked a little bit in the assembly output. So this is the assembly output of GCC. Um, Left-hand side is still complex and right-hand side is handcrafted, so it's basically the same amount of operations, but if you look at the details, here's just plain assembly instructions, and here is hidden one little call to some mool DC3. So this is like um, really, that is basically the reason why, at least also in the GCC case, um, it's slower. If you look at std complex from Clang, it's basically a similar thing. So this is basically your for loop now just a bunch of operation and here inside there's also again um, a little call. And now this is really insane. Um, so that function that gets called is this function. Yeah, what is it doing? Um, that's the header, so that's from the header, so that's from the standard header, so this is operator star. Yeah, operator star in the um, header and you see it's like, creating a lot of temporaries, and then it's checking, branching a lot. So um, if, is none, and left end, or right end side, or both, yeah, and then uh, is infinite, and copy sign, is none again, copy sign again. So is this just checks for corner cases? Yeah, it, it's, it's really... Full, full IEEE compliance. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what I found out. So it's full IEEE compliance, and... For instance, and I was also searching a little bit in the web, so for instance, Fortran doesn't do that, so then people were comparing like C++ with Fortran, and then, oh yeah, again, Fortran is much faster, and blah, 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 and, but the, the point is that Fortran is not, is not IEEE compliant, so they just do it as you would do it. I mean, I, I don't actually know about the background of that, so I mean, in reality, from what I'm looking, I can see there, if my number is really infinite or not a number, I, I mean, I'm screwed anyways and I don't <laughs> care about if the sign is still correct or whatever that thing is doing. So I just want the result. So I mean, I have to take care of myself. And also this is not in the idea of C++ so that I don't pay for stuff I don't want. So this is really not C++ mindset um, if you program it like that. Um, just a quick summary of what I found in GCC. So this little call in GCC basically was a call to a um, function yeah, from the library of GCC, um, which is doing the same. So then I found out that there is a, actually there is a little option in GCC, which you can enable, which is called mm. fast math. But only GCC has this option. And actually, if you enable that, you get same performance for all of the implementations. So 
Yeah, just one moment. And so GCC fast is basically now whatever you do, state complex, naive, expression template, handcrafted, it's all the same. So GCC is still the one that can, can reach the perfect speed. And um, so GCC without mass, we've seen before, and the others is like D4. So there's not such an option, but just to get an um, overview of the comparison. So yeah, your, your question. Okay. Yeah. 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 I would have checked that if I had it. So I, yeah. when I was working on but Linux, I. Yeah. Yeah. It's the okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The point is, it's not. I mean, this is. It is kind of known. It's what? Forting, okay, yeah. So uh, the question was, uh, or the, the, the remark was that there is a option in the in this C, in C that you can disable and enable that option by default, and Intel compiler has it enabled by default. So, but the point is, is all, it, first of all, it's not really documented, and it's also not, um, not you don't have that option in the compiler. I mean, some, some do it, some don't, so it's, you really have to pray and hope that it works, and plus the overhead of, I mean, even if you, I mean, the, if you enable it, it, the handcrafted version should be basically on par with the, um, no, the, the, the naive version or the expression template version should be on par with the, with the handcrafted, but we don't get that speed, unfortunately, so. Okay, I know, basically my conclusions. So, um, standard, so in general, standard library is not streamlined for number crunching code, so. You can do that, but usually you have to do it on your own. So um, for Clang, there is no such option. I also from, from the code, you see there was no if there for anything. And um, basically, my rem if you're using complex numbers on Clang, don't use that complex. So if you want speed, forget it. So this is like not, not usable. GCC, if you have GCC, use fast math as a compiler flag, then you get pretty much really the best performance you can get. Of course, you can always do this. The next step would be doing simplifying the whole thing, but I mean, I didn't want to look into that. This makes everything just more complicated and platform dependent. And so in general, also GCC still produces the best code, especially if you enable that compiler flag. And yeah, for cross-platform, basically you do work your own class. So because um, you, and probably even using expression templates because as we have, see, as we have seen, um, Microsoft compiler still benefits from expression templates. In general, I would say the, the standard should be extended there a little bit so the, you don't pay for what you don't use. So STIT complex should get like a little policy that you can specify use IEEE compliance or not. And then you enable it and it should be disabled by default. So just my point for that. And yeah, that's basically it. So thank you. More questions? So the expression templates, I didn't see where you were actually taking advantage of the power of them. I didn't show that. It's um, so uh, the question was um, he didn't see where where I took the uh, advantage of the power of expression template. I mean, what I showed was just a snippet of how you would implement it, and my implementation is like many many pages long. So I also I, I had a Boost Proto version, and then I had a handcrafted version in order just to see um, how that. So my handcrafted expression templates were slightly faster than the Proto version, but um, basically both were kind of performing the same. But I didn't show that, so this is really just, um, if you're interested, I can give you the code, but. Well, can you give us a summary of, of what operations you combined that you got the efficiency, or believe you got the efficiency from? Um, yeah, I mean, I, what I did is more, more or less a naive implementation of the expression template, so I didn't do any, com I mean, just really com computing the real, at once, so in the end, I call real, and then it computes the real part of the whole full expression oh. in one step, and then imaginary in one step, instead of having all those intermediate real and imaginary parts in between. So that's the main difference there. Yeah. Another question? Okay, then let's, ah. I guess yeah, I would kind of expect then that the expression template isn't buying you anything, since you're doing multiplies, you have to 
size anyway, right? So if you were just doing like real on A plus B, mm -hmm. then as mentioned, that like would say, why do we even need this? Again? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, the, the question or the remark was that it actually doesn't bring much in that example. If, for that example, actually, the difference was, wasn't was that great, but um, I didn't put it up. Um, maybe I, uh, I find that some uh, my numbers. Uh, summary, so they actually had another test where they had a much more complicated expression, and so this is like the, the second row, this is like the expression template column, and there you see like for, depending on the compiler, you see actually a lot of benefit also for expression templates, so twice the speed or even seven times the speed or two times, so the if the comp if the expression gets even really more complicated, so this was a really complicated expression there, which I was testing, and that then you you, you get more benefit from the expression template. And your handcrafted one, what did you do to try and be better than what was implemented in the standard? I so so the question was and um, for what what did I try to be better? And handcrafted handcrafted was just really as a benchmark it was just a a comparison. So. I hope the compiler should be as efficient as the handcrafted. That's it, basically. So there, I didn't try to improve was anything. It, was it using like uh, assembly instructions? Or was no, it no, I didn't use any assembly. It was the handcrafted. Basically, is the C version kind of. So how if you well, it's kind of if you don't have yeah if you don't have if you don't have any kind of um, abstraction mechanisms in the language, nice. you would write it that way, basically. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. One, one, one last question, maybe. Okay. When you were doing these benchmarks, uh, like what was your general setup? Because um, you went to the talk yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, I, I didn't measure the variance and all compared all that kind of stuff. I just did a lot of, um, I, but I, at least I bootstrapped the, the, the test. So I was just running the first and the second and the fourth. I was like building a collection of all the tests and I was bootstrapping them and then I run them in different order and collecting the results and then I computed the, the median, uh, the, the mean from that. Yeah. I guess so, I was just wondering if you ran the same test multiple times. No, 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 no. I, I really, I changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I changed. I was randomly chosen at least to get a little bit um, better statistics there. So I would say then making space for the second speaker. Thank you.